Forgive me. It is not my wish to fight with you. I pray you'll bear me no grudge in turn. Hello, and welcome to another Fire Emblem Archetype episode. I'm sorry it's been so long in between these episodes, but I hope that you guys will continue to look forward to them in the future. And for today's episode, we're going to be discussing the Camus Archetype, or as we now have come to know him thanks to the Fey Channel livestream, which finally yielded us with an official pronunciation, Camus. Oh, hi, Camus! Yeah, guys, we, uh, we really should have checked the Japanese pronunciation on that one because uh, it was kind of right in our faces. But honestly, I'll probably flip-flop back and forth in between Camus and Camus in this episode, just because I have more of an association with Camus, and Camus is still a little strange for me, but, you know. Today's episode is once again sponsored by our amazing friends over at Amino Apps. Amino is, of course, the awesome fan community app where you can check out and join sub-communities for just about any of your favorite games or series. My favorite has always been the Fire Emblem fan community, of course, but there's also a bunch more for just about anything else under the sun. Personally, I love talking about Fire Emblem Hero skill builds and coming up with creative new skill sets for characters, but the fan-made quizzes and polls can also be heaps of fun too. It's really just a cool way to interact with other fans and connect over our favorite aspects of this great series. This time around, I'll also be doing a giveaway for you guys as well. We're going to be giving away two Google Play or Apple Store gift cards so you guys can use them to snag yourself some extra orbs and heroes, or for whatever else you want to use them for. If you'd like to enter to win one of the gift cards, all you have to do is simply download Amino, if you haven't already, search for the Fire Emblem fan community, then find us over there by searching for Lucky Crit. Finally, leave a post on our wall sharing with us your all-time favorite character in the Fire Emblem series. Whether you want to share with us some of your beautiful hand-drawn fan art, or you just want to let us know who's your favorite and why, the choice is yours. The two winners will be selected at random a few days after this video first airs, and they'll receive chat invites from us, so make sure to keep an eye out on your notifications. Good luck, guys. Now, back to Camus. Camus characters have a rich history throughout the Fire Emblem series. Camus are characters who share similar traits to the original Camus, hailing from the very first game, Fire Emblem Dark Dragon and the Sword of Light. Camus are typically enemy generals who, despite being on the opposite side of the conflict, bear no ill will towards the player's army, and may even have loved ones or friends among your characters. Instead of just switching teams and joining you though, they're incredibly loyal to their country or lord, even if they know that they're fighting on the wrong side of history. Unlike many other enemy characters in the series, they're capable of showing kindness and compassion toward their subordinates, and even the characters in your army, which really sets them apart from most of the typical enemies in the series. They don't seem to have any concern about falling in battle and dying for what they believe in. The one thing I cannot do is betray my motherland. I believe that the Camus archetype is integral to the Fire Emblem series because they are the archetype of internal conflict. They actually allow for the humanization of the enemy army, giving the player some real remorse for their decisions and choices, and reminding them that they are not just cutting down those who are evil. I also think it makes things more realistic in that not all of the good people can be recruited into your army. This archetype is a great example that archetypes in general do exist in the Fire Emblem series, as a lot of the characters I'll be mentioning have a lot of similar character traits and circumstances surrounding them. Due to their unwavering loyalty and stubbornness though, some fans may find them hypocritical, truly unsympathetic, or maybe even just stupid. Too often we see Camus characters take their loyalty too far, beyond the point of reason. If they would just abandon their stubbornness and fight for what is truly right and just, they'd have the potential to save countless lives that would be lost in the conflict, and still help their nation and the world itself by dethroning its evil ruler. There's really no point in dying for the bad guys just because you were drafted into their ranks or ended up on their side. For the rest of us though, this archetype comprises characters that a lot of us admired while playing through the games, and wished we could recruit, but never got the chance to, since most of these characters do indeed tend to die fighting the player's army, solidifying their immovable allegiance to their nations, and fighting for their beliefs to the bitter end. Because of this though, I do want to throw up a pretty big spoiler warning here. While I'm not going to be spoiling major plot details or the entirety of these games in the series to discuss these characters, I will be mentioning various circumstances about these characters' deaths, various plot details that might reveal a little bit more and give further insight into some of these characters, so if you want to remain completely unspoiled about the entire Fire Emblem series and all of these games that we're going to be going through, I definitely recommend that you check out this video in the future once you've played all of the games in the series, because otherwise you're probably going to catch some spoilers here or there. But without further ado, let's get started. Obviously today we'll be starting off with the original, Camus himself. Fire Emblem Dark Dragon and the Sword of Light, and its remake, 
Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon. A brilliant general and captain of the elite Sable Order, Camus is a knight of Grust, said to be the most able warrior alive, and is allied with the evil empire of Dolor, despite his sense of honor and integrity. When Dolor orders Nina's execution, he takes her to Aurelis so that Hardin can protect her, incurring the wrath of Medius and betraying his country for the first and only time. For his actions, he is imprisoned and kept barely alive for a time. His compassion for Nina is the only thing that can subvert his intense loyalty. Marth attempts to persuade Camus into joining his cause, but to no avail. Even after his imprisonment, Camus refuses to turn on his liege, despite also having misgivings about his orders. To Marth's and Nina's chagrin, Camus is seemingly killed in battle. Eldigan, Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War. Commander of the Cross Knights and the Lord of Augustria's House Nordian, Lachesis' older brother, Eldigan, is another classic example of the Camus archetype. He is extremely loyal to the royalty of Augustria, in part due to his holy blood from the crusader Hazul, the original founder of Augustria, and his family line's oath to pledge their eternal loyalty and protect the royal family by wielding the legendary blade Mistletane. Originally a close friend to both Sigurd and Quan after having met at Belhalla's military academy, Augustria eventually enters a war against Granvale, pitting the friends on opposite sides of the conflict. Though compassionate or kind-hearted might not be the first adjectives that come to mind when thinking of Eldigan, we can see that he does care deeply for the people of his nation, telling Elliot that in war it's the powerless citizens who suffer, not the noble class. He seeks to avoid huge sacrifices on both sides. He eventually attempts to convince King Shagal to end the buildup of his military, resulting in him being arrested by his own king and nation. Despite this, his loyalty never wavers. He's eventually freed when Sigurd conquers Augusti. When Sigurd is forced to occupy Eldigan's native Nordian during the country's civil war, Eldigan becomes furious. He tells Sigurd that if such were to happen again, he wouldn't hesitate to strike him down. Eldigan then gives Sigurd one year to restore peace and leave Augustria. Over the next six months, he stations his cross knights in Silvale, prepared to take out Sigurd if he breaks their agreement. Sigurd is eventually forced into battle against Shigal's forces, resulting in Eldigan deciding to lead the cross knights against him due to his immense loyalty for the royal family and his country. Lachesis pleads for Eldigan to negotiate a truce between King Shigal and Sigurd's forces, which, interestingly enough, does cause Eldigan to reconsider. He then departs from the battlefield to discuss the situation with Shigal. However, the king refuses to listen to him and has Eldigan executed for treason. Ishtar, Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War, and Thracia 776. Known as the Goddess, Goddess of, of Thunder, Thunder, Ishtar is the scion of House Frege of Granvale, a full-blooded descendant of the Crusader Thrud, an inheritor of the Mjolnir. She is a kind and caring woman, torn between duty and desire. She is betrothed to Granvale's Crown Prince Julius and serves as a warrior in his service. Even though she is immensely loyal to Julius, she is still strong enough and caring enough to defy his orders behind his back, with the biggest example of this being her providing aid to the children captured in the child hunts. Sacrifice children to that dark god? I cannot do it, Lord Julius. Please forgive me. Julius's descent into darkness troubles her deeply. She also does her best to comfort her cousin Tyne or Linda, despite her mother treating them poorly. When Julius comes down with a severe fever, she travels to Leinster to find Sias, seeking his assistance in healing Julius. Though she doesn't hate Seleph or bear any ill will towards him or the Liberation Army, her love for Julius and her family prevent her from joining him, despite any convincing. She eventually dies fighting them on the battlefield. Reinhardt, Fire Emblem Thracia 776. Referred to as the second coming of the legendary crusader Thrud, though he does not bear his familial blood, Reinhardt is a formidable and admired mage knight in Frisia's army, and leader of the Gelbritter. He's also Ishtar's personal bodyguard since childhood. He is Olwen's older brother, whom she initially admires, and though they end up on opposing sides of the conflict, he refuses to attack Olwen on the battlefield. Julius is jealous of the close relationship that he shares with Ishtar, and eventually informs Ishtar that if Reinhardt enters his site again, he will be killed. Though Ishtar doesn't want to lose her longtime protector, she reluctantly obeys and has Reinhardt stay behind as they leave for other parts of the continent. When Sias questions why he's still in the region, he answers that he's concerned for his currently missing sister. When told that Olwen may be with the opposing Liberation Army, he still wants to speak with her. When Olwen finally does speak with him at the river in Chapter 22, he initially tries to convince her to leave with him. Olwen pleads to rescue the children imprisoned in Frege, and Reinhardt eventually accepts her determination. He then gives her a blessed sword, showcasing his stubbornly intense loyalty to his nation, 
yet also his devotion to his sister. All attempts to convince Reinhardt to abandon Frege and join the Liberation Army fail. He is ultimately killed or captured by Leif's army after the conflict. Next up, we have a trio this time around. Murdoch, Gale, and Brunya, Fire Emblem, the Binding Blade. Murdoch is a very interesting Camus. A fairly popular character in Japan, Murdoch is a humble military commander of Bern, and second to only Zephiel himself. He appears briefly, 20 years prior, in Binding Blade's prequel, Blazing Blade, where he is shown to be protective of young Prince Zephiel. When King Desmond poisons Zephiel, it is he who nurses him back to health. He later appears before Elowid's group in a village, offering them a warp staff as thanks for their aid in protecting Zephiel. Though he's ultimately on the wrong side of the conflict, he shows great compassion for those around him, and even for those who find themselves in Roy's army. He displays great disdain when facing off against the likes of certain members of Roy's group, like his former ally Milady. Murdoch is eventually sent to the Shrine of Seals to serve as the final line of defense against Roy, where he mentions to Gale how impressed he is of Roy's army, and greatly appreciates the chance to personally test Roy's skills. He also shares his regrets that circumstances will force him to fight Milady and Zeiss. His final regret, after falling in battle against Roy, is that he could no longer protect Zephiel. The interesting aspect to Murdoch is that he does not even remotely disagree with his commander's orders. Perhaps this could, in theory, disqualify him from being a Camus, considering most other Camus do have some level of disdain or disagreement for the orders that they are given or the choices of their king, but I do feel that he still does have some merit as a part of the archetype. Gale. Lover of Milady and mentor to her younger brother Zeiss, Gale is a fierce wyvern lord and one of Burn's most skilled generals. He eventually becomes the third dragon general of Burn under Murdoch, after having been snubbed from the position originally by Narshan. Despite this, his loyalty to Burn is unshakable, and even when pitted against his former lover, he does not waver. At one point, he tells Milady that he is truly grateful to have met her, and that the days he spent training and fighting alongside her were among the happiest days of his life. His final words mention Melody and Zeiss when he dies fighting Roy's army. Brunya, another of the three dragon generals of Bern, and holding the distinction of having decimated the Lycian League's army alongside Narshan, which resulted in Lord Hector being severely wounded, Brunya is another tragic example of the Camus archetype. Once again, she displays both the poise and stubbornness of one who follows her leader's orders, yet also displays her kind side to her allies and even to her foes. She is eventually entrusted with the invasion of Sakae, but voices concerns she has about Zephiel working with a sinister figure like Ethun, though after hearing his rebuttal, she follows his orders faithfully. During the fall of Burn-controlled Etruria, Rorts and Accardo flee into Burn-controlled territory seeking refuge. She reassures them that they will not be abandoned. After entrusting Athun to John at the Dragon Sanctuary, she and the remainder of the Burn army prepare to defend against Roy's forces, all the while being totally aware that the odds are completely against them and that the fight would be futile. Showing her inner compassion upon Roy's arrival, Brunya informs her men that any of them could retreat with no consequences so that they could survive, though very few did choose to, and the army expressed its loyalty and solidarity with both her and Burn to the bitter end. She dies facing Roy's army. Lloyd and Linus Reed, Fire Emblem, The Blazing Blade. Elite members deeply loyal to the Black Fang and tasked with the elimination of the Lycian Lords Elowood, Hector, and Lin, it can also be argued that these two fulfill the requirements of being Camus as well. Of the two, Lloyd is the more level-headed while Linus is more brash. They both care deeply for Nino, their stepsister, but don't fully trust her mother and their now stepmother, Sonia. They're both sworn to the Black Fang, an organization of assassins established by their father Brendan Reed to kill corrupt nobles and help the poor. However, it is eventually infiltrated by Nurgle's morphs and corrupted from within to fulfill his ambitions. Being the sons of Brendan Reed and two members of the four elite Four Fangs that make up the most powerful of the Black Fang, Lloyd and Linus are willing to take any order that their father gives, even while they do not like the stranglehold that Sonya begins to develop upon their father and the Fang itself. Depending upon how the story plays out, either Linus or Lloyd is fought and defeated by Elowid and company. If Lloyd is defeated, he lets the group go and seeks to find answers to the Black Fang's descent into madness, but is ultimately killed by Limstella before he can do so. If Linus is defeated, he finally hears out Elowid, Lynn, and Hector, and realizes they are good-natured and not what he had come to believe them as being. Seeking to relay this information to Lloyd, he is confronted by Limstella and ultimately killed before his message can be spread. 
The Reed brother that did not fight Elwood and company is then led to believe that the death of their brother was at the hands of Elwood and the Lycian League, and they lead the last remnants of the Black Fang to the Shrine of Seals to defend it from them. The deep respect and love that Lloyd and Linus shared for each other as brothers racks the survivor with such grief that they wish for nothing more than to join each other in death. Regardless of which brother is still alive, in the ensuing confrontation at the shrine, Nino's pleas for them to leave the Black Fang fall upon deaf ears, and they follow their orders to their last breath. Uhai, Fire Emblem, the Blazing Blade. Nomadic trooper and once the soaring hawk of the Black Fang, his strong sense of honor can be witnessed during moments such as when he pretends to kidnap Lin and take her hostage, but instead chooses to release her when he could have easily killed her. He mentions to Lin that the Black Fang was the first place where he ever felt at home. Upon his death, he hints the player towards the location of the Dragon's Gate. Lin and Elowood mourn him, citing that they wish they could have met him under different circumstances. He also sympathizes with Brendan Reed's ideology of wanting to help the weak. Uhai does not trust Nurgle or the changes that he has brought to the Black Fang. Despite these misgivings though, he still serves Black Fang to the end, even if he does give Elowood's group crucial information about the Dragon's Gate. Selina, Fire Emblem, the Sacred Stones. One of Grado's Imperial Three, the Floor Spar, Mage Knight Selina, is yet another tragic Kamu character. She was born in a poor village in Grado, and once received supplies sent to the village from Emperor Vigard. This shocked her, as the village was unable to even pay its taxes, yet was still sent aid. This kindness, on behalf of the Emperor, later inspired her to enroll and become a part of Grado's knighthood. One of Vigard's most loyal supporters, she went on to receive the title the Floor Spar from Emperor Vigard himself. If recruited as a Spot Pass character in Fire Emblem Awakening, she will inform the player that even then, her heart still belongs to Grado. In her first appearance in the Sacred Stones, she is shown warning villagers to lock their doors to protect themselves from bandit activity in the area. Not recognizing the Princess of Renee, she eventually bestows a gift to Erica as incentive to chase off the bandits once Erica mentions being a mercenary for hire. Even though she'd become a high-ranking Grado general, her kindness towards the citizens of Renee was not stifled. She is even at one point deemed untrustworthy to the Grado cause, and is called back to Grado Keep by Emperor Vigard. This does not dissuade her either, however. Later on in Ephraim's route, Murr approaches Selina, asking her to return her Dragonstone and telling her about the darkness surrounding Grado Keep. Selina does not return Murr's Dragonstone, but does allow Murr to return to Ephraim's side unharmed before the coming battle begins. Even when confronted with the fact that the Emperor is no longer the man that she originally swore to serve, she refuses to back down, and is subsequently killed by Ephraim's forces. Though Selina can be recruited in the post-game creature campaign, as with many other enemy characters featured in the Sacred Stones, I won't stop her from being counted as a Camu character simply due to this fact. Boss characters recruited this way are not quite their usual selves, have no dialogue and support conversations, and are much more of a reward or unlockable gift to players than they are their actual characters. Shaharam, Fire Emblem Path of Radiance. Day in general, under Patrine, and the father of Jill, Shaharam is a more obscure Camu character, but many fans deem him as a proper fit for this archetype. Alongside Har, he left the Benyan Sacred Knights due to the developing corruption of the Benyan Senate, 18 years before the events of Path of Radiance. Plagued by being a branded traitor after abandoning Benyan, he will do anything to earn the respect of Dayan, even while they don't value him at all. Not even his daughter can convince him to stand down. He does not seek to harm Laguz, but in order to remain in the good graces of Dayan, he's forced to organize Laguz hunts. He is even ordered by General Patrine to flood his own territory, Talrega, to halt the advance of Ike and the Crimean Liberation Army. When confronted, he refuses to back down, stating, Until one of us has fallen, the water will continue to flow. He even says of Ike, So that's the enemy general, eh? If he's the man he appears to be, I can die knowing that Jill is safe. He is even shown as envious of King Kainigus while fighting Laguz, stating, You of the Beast Tribe, I was always envious of how you were blessed with such a glorious lord and master. This is likely due to his disdain for his own leader, Ashnard. If he encounters Raisin on the battlefield, he also begs forgiveness of the goddess, knowing that Raisin is among the last of his kind and what he must do to him as a general of Dayan. Ultimately, it's his pride that leads him to his bitter end, providing him a somewhat avoidable but tragic death. I have however seen some fans mention that Shaharam is one of the worst offenders of the Camus, since he owes little to no loyalty to Dayan and doesn't have much of a reason to side with them. Bryce, Fire Emblem Path of Radiance. One of the four riders of Dayan, old friend to Ike's father Gawain and wielder of the legendary weapon Wishblade, 
Bryce is a seasoned day in general with a storied history in their service. Even after Ashnard reveals to him that it was he who killed the previous king, he still remains deeply loyal, believing that the royal bloodline must be preserved. Bryce has fully devoted his life to Dayan, even though he displays occasional confusion toward the lack of care that Ashnard has when losing battles. In battle, if confronting Tyrannio, Bryce reveals that he is fully aware that what King Ashnard and Dayan are doing is wrong, but believes there is nothing he can do to stop his king. He tells Tyrannio that he sees nothing save for a land of absolute darkness and terror. Some men can change, Tyrannio. Others cannot. I am of the latter type. There is no other reason. He shares a connection with Ina, telling her that she too has had her fate warped by the king. He then tells her that she should pray, so that she could at least know peace in her final moments. He is ultimately slain in the courtyard of Melior Castle by Ike in the Crimean army. Upon his death, Ike remarks that he fought with much honor. Lavelle, Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn. Follower of the Code of Chivalry, Lavelle is a Benyon general and is extremely loyal to Zelgius, whom he feels may be the last true knight. He eventually serves as Zelgius' second in command. During his time in the Benyon army, he grows frustrated with the senator's obsessions with glory and rewards over the horror and reality of war. He is shown to be quite kind and lighthearted, and once again bears no ill will towards his enemies. He eventually develops an undying loyalty towards Zelgius. Out of respect for Alincia's courage, upon laying down her sword for Crimea's neutrality, he and Zelgius retreat alongside much of the central army during the clash against the Lagoos alliance in Crimea. As a result of this, Senator Valtome orders the execution of Zelgius, to which Lavelle attempts to persuade Valtome against. Lavelle is unable to convince Valtome, but Zelgius is spared when Emperor Sanaki and her Holy Guard arrive. During the final battle between Ike and the Black Knight in the tower, Lavelle is tasked by Zelgius with leading the remaining disciples of order to defeat the intruders and their army. He refuses to back down, even when facing Sanaki's forces, though he will not attack Sanaki, the Herons, or Mikaya, who Zelgius ordered are to remain unharmed, though doing so would also go against Lavelle's personal code of chivalry anyway. Lavelle falls in this battle, allowing Ike and Mikaya to continue further in the tower. Interestingly enough, Lavelle was absent in both the 2017 and 2018 Fire Emblem Heroes Choose Your Legends polls. Lavelle shares this aspect with fellow Camus Bryce and Shaharam. Just thought that was interesting. Hetzel, Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn. This is a tricky one that you may not think fits, but is worthy of a mention. Duke of Asmin and senior member of the Benyon Senate, Hetzel never condoned the Senate's malicious actions towards the Herons or the Apostle, though his inability to oppose them on these matters allowed for them to take place. He seems rather cowardly and frail, opting to take the path of least resistance, and only does the right thing when he does not feel threatened. I've seen some fans state that Hetzel simply can't be a Camus, because honor is a pretty major aspect of the Camus archetype, and Hetzel certainly has no honor, operating out of fear alone. Though I will say that Hetzel does seem to have some redeeming qualities. At one point, he pays an exorbitant price to purchase the Heron Prince Raphael, only to return him to the Serenus Forest following his recovery showcasing that Hetzel does possess innate compassion and empathy. Depending on who fights him and speaks to him in battle, he will either express regret and seek forgiveness, make excuses for his actions, or berate the character for not following the will of the goddess Asherah. This makes Hetzel seem rather disingenuous in regards to the many moments of compassion that he shared, though I suppose it could be argued that actions speak louder than words, and he did, at the end of the day, choose to set Prince Raphael free. Mustafa, Fire Emblem Awakening Berserker and enemy general of Plegia, he is moved enough after hearing Emmerin's words to reconsider his role in the war. He even allows his soldiers to lay down their arms if they no longer want to fight, accepting the blame or failure of his army himself. He vows to protect Krom's army as much as he could if they were to surrender, though he knows that they will not. He does not want to fight Krom, but feels he has no choice as Gangrel would murder his family to make an example out of him. In the end, he dies at the hands of Krom's army. With his dying breath, he asks them to spare his remaining soldiers. Yenfei, Fire Emblem Awakening. King of Chan Sin and the older brother of Seiri, Yenfei's country is decimated and overtaken by Walhart, who Yenfei is later forced to serve under. Excellus allows Seiri to live on the condition that Yenfei serve as one of Walhart's generals, though Yenfei chooses to not reveal this to Seiri. Once Seiri leaves the country, he still continues to serve Walhart, fearing that Seiri would be found and killed if he broke ties with his army. He is eventually killed by Krom, refusing to reveal the reason for his dedication toward Walhart's cause. The recruitable alternate future Yen Fei displays a lot of guilt that he should have died instead of Seiri in his timeline due to his actions, 
showing a softer side to him that the original Yen Fei from Krom's timeline kept hidden. During his supports with the Avatar, Yen Fei reveals that he defended Seiri's grave from Risen and occasionally worked as a mercenary for food and to prevent others from experiencing the same grief that he did. Though he does not have interactions with his subordinates while part of Walhart's army, personally I feel the compassion and commitment he displays towards his sister Seiri is enough to reveal that he is a kind-hearted character and worthy of this archetype. Though his loyalty for his country may not be as genuine as other Camus, due to his differing circumstances surrounding his recruitment to the Valmese, he still fights for the army in which the military from his home capital are a part of, which may seek to expand the loyalty that he feels towards Valm. Xander, Birthright Path, Fire Emblem Fates Birthright This is probably the trickiest, and arguably the most debatable one we've come across so far. No surprises though, as it's a Fates character after all. Fates just seems destined to be argued about. Crown Prince of Nor and wielder of the legendary Siegfried, Xander is the eldest Norian sibling and somewhat of a role model for the Avatar, even helping with their combat training. Being the crown-bearing sibling, Xander displays immense loyalty and patriotism towards Nor. He obeys and carries out every whim of his father, King Garen, even when he does not completely personally agree with the repercussions or intentions behind the orders. When presented evidence that Garen has changed or become evil, Xander reveals that he believes the king will return to his old loving self once the war is over. His love for his siblings can override his loyalty to his father, however, with examples of this being when the Avatar is sent to quell the Ice Tribe Rebellion alone, and Xander sends them help. Even though he knows the Avatar is not his true sibling by blood, he still treats them as such, with no disdain. Even with his immense loyalty though, he still distrusts his father's retainers, Iago, Hans, and Zola, for their actions, and even arrests Hans and sends him to prison until Garen later liberates him. When Iago attempts to eliminate the Avatar, Xander steps in, vowing to kill him and be rid of him for his cruel, disgraceful, and cowardly ways. He shows no hesitation when Leo executes him. His supports with Nyx reveal that he feels an immense guilt for each and every life that he has taken on the battlefield. He believes that all he has done is for the sake of bringing glory to Nor. When the Avatar chooses to side with Hoshido, Xander desperately attempts to change their mind. At the Opera House in Circensia, he witnesses the Avatar raising their sword to Garen, to which he brands them a traitor and begins his assault, though he does not succeed in slaying the Avatar. He later finds Elise eavesdropping on King Garen and berates her, citing that she could be executed for treason. When she begins to cry, he softens his tone, remarking that the war is ruining their beloved family and tearing them apart. Appearing in the training grounds of Castle Krakenberg, he urges Laszlo and Perry to flee, as he does not want them to be killed in battle. He then challenges the Avatar to a one-on-one -on -one duel. While charging to deal the finishing blow against the Avatar, Elise jumps in the way, becoming mortally wounded. Xander, in shock, cradles Elise while she, in her final breath, pleads for him to end the war, not only with his strength, but also his kindness and love. Despite the death of his beloved sister, Xander still does not back down, and demands the Avatar continue their duel. When Laszlo and Perry arrive, they immediately assume that Elise's death is on behalf of the Avatar and rouse the Norian troops. While Xander objects to their interference, they defy him, seeking to provide him backup before he is killed. The duel concludes with the Avatar emerging as the victor, to which Xander reveals that he did not fight at his full strength and only did what he did because of his role as the Crown Prince of Nor. He then succumbs to his wounds while remarking about fighting alongside the Avatar in an alternate world. Some fans argue that Xander has no excuse for continuing to side with Nor after such events like Garen blatantly attempting to get his own children killed, thus creating a bit of a controversial underside to Xander as a Camus character, since he doesn't really seem to be bothered much by this fact. It may also be argued that Xander is not a real Camus character due to the many differences between his character and the representation of him in various paths of Fire Emblem Fates. But I certainly do think that this birthright version of him does seem to fit the archetype quite well. Some fans also consider Rudolph from Fire Emblem Gaiden and Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valentia to be a Camus character, but honestly I think that being the Emperor switches things up a little bit and there are other things about him that I think differentiate him from this archetype. I also don't really consider Ryoma to be a Camus, even in Fire Emblem Fates Conquest where he's the enemy, as he always believes that what he's doing is right, and honestly the Hoshidans are pretty clearly the good guys in the Fates storyline so he doesn't really get a moment to be a part of the army on the wrong side of the conflict. Interesting side note here, if you play Fire Emblem Heroes and have Reinhardt, Camus, Eldigan, or Xander in your cavalry team, you're using mostly Camus characters. It's interesting to think that some of the most popular cavalry characters and heroes are characters that we never got a chance to recruit before. 
So that's going to just about do it for today's episode. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you really enjoyed our discussion about Camus archetype characters here today. If you think anybody else should have been in this video or should be a part of this archetype, if you have evidence, be sure to leave it in the comment section down below. And also just let me know how you feel about this archetype in general, considering it's a little bit hit and miss with most people. But once again, thank you so much for tuning in and getting this far into the video. If you liked it, be sure to do me a solid and slash that thumbs up down below. Thank you once again to our amazing sponsor, Amino Apps. And also a huge shout out to all of our amazing patrons. You guys are incredible. I'll be working on getting behind the scenes content to a much more frequent schedule in the coming days. I'm sorry it's been a little while without an update, but I will be working hard at trying to bring that back and make it even more consistent than ever because that is something that I've kind of felt really bad about and I really do want to bolster that and make it a lot better. So we'll definitely see how I can do that in the coming days. If you want to stay up to date on the latest Fire Emblem news, be sure to follow us on Twitter, and you can also be a part of even more discussions by joining our Discord server, which I'll link below as well, so be sure to do that. And if you want some merch, I've got some merch. And I'll see you in the next episode.